What up, ladies and gentlemen? Jesse Warden here. I'm in Texas this week. And uh, a lot of you have been asking about tech interviews, how do you pass them. What we're going to talk about today is really, you know, everyone's asking about tech interviews and passing tech interviews and interviews in general. And I'm really just going to tell you two things that I found useful, okay? And the first is how you, you get the job, right, by not having the interview. And number two, just give you some stories and um some hacks on how to pass behavior interviews. Those two things I think you'll find valuable. But I would highly encourage you to go look at personal branding, go look at uh, do networking and things like that, and a lot of ways to avoid the whole interview process. Interview process in the tech industry is broken, it doesn't work, and there's still a lot of science going on to figure out what the best way to do it. Behavior interviews, which are currently the lauded way, have a 55% success rate. Flip a coin. That's the best we can do in <laughs> 2014. So with that said, I want to give a shout out to a lot of the good resources I think are good. LinkedIn, the most useless social networking site I've ever used is LinkedIn. One thing LinkedIn has that's quite interesting is the ability to provide articles daily. They actually have about four or five in the very top. And that's it. It's not like CNN or other websites which you know, inundate you with links. And I find that a lot of the content they either aggregate or link to is very interesting and relevant to career and jobs in general. So I find that very interesting. I'm surprised at you know the high quality content. They clearly have somebody vetting that and it's a very good resource. So from that standpoint, if you have LinkedIn, it's something that you could actually utilize that I didn't think, you know, I thought it was a waste of time, but I've, I've actually been uh, really enjoyed a lot of the articles I've read. Number two is uh, actually jobsearch.about.com. They have some really good articles there. A woman named Allison Doyle has written a significant amount of wonderful articles from job interviews, dealing with soft skills, the way you approach people, the way you talk to people in interviews, specifically about behavior interviews. Her articles allowed me to get, I believe, my job at Accenture. It was that particular article using the star process and some of the things she outlined. Reading that, so I got my job. Obviously, working hard and knowing a little bit about programming had a little bit to do with it, right? But they have a four-step process, and three of those are behavior interviews. And lastly, Jace, this guy right here. He's actually got a lot of wonderful software development videos on YouTube that explain all about software development process. If you're just getting into it, or you've been in a while, you're looking for a career change, or there's certain things about the soft side of the industry, right, that you don't understand. Jace does a great job, good production values in his videos, so definitely check this guy out. You can either play the game, get played by it, or you can make your own rules. Now, what does that really mean? It basically means you can get played, you go to tech interviews, and hope they recognize you for the pimp that you are. You kind of just go with the flow, get a tech interview, and if your company goes under, you get another one. You do the minimal amount of effort in invested in interviews. Writing your resume, getting dressed, having good hygiene, having a positive attitude. That's not enough. It's not enough anymore, kids. The American dream is dying. The best thing you can do is a lot more, right? Or avoid interviews. Play the game means you play the game, right? It's a game. Interviewing is a game. It's a job. Like all games, there are players, there's an objective, there are antagonists and protagonists, and there's an end goal to win, getting the job, right? Passing the tech interview, getting them to recognize you as someone they want on their team. So you wear the suit, you practice star and fizz buzz, Right? You memorize the APIs of your favorite framework that you put on your resume that they're hiring for. You have sample code that you can bring that shows, you know, like maybe I failed at the FizzBud, but I can code. Look, at I did this yesterday. And you OD on Prozac to make sure you're really happy and positive. That's playing the game. Or you can make your own rules. That is networking and personal branding. That means avoiding this insane process of actually having the interview. You should basically have the job before you even ask for the job. Does that make sense? Having the job before the interview, bypassing this insane process to begin with, is done in three ways. It's either networking, right? Knowing people, going to industry meetings, meeting them, developing relationships, people you worked with, making sure that when you leave the company that you've been with for five years, that everyone you've worked with will hopefully say good things about you to others. They would or would not recommend you to someone they work with, say, yes, I would love to have that person, or yes, he's okay, I'd bring him on, definitely, right? Anywhere in that range is what you want. You don't want them to go, you know, he was a pain to work with, I don't want to recommend that. You, you don't even have to have the interview at that point. It's just, they're just confirming their own biases. Networking is, is very powerful from that perspective, but more from an outside perspective. You know some guy who works from a tech giant that you met at a user group meeting. You had a conversation with him, you met him at the bar, you went out to dinner afterwards at some conference, you found out he was neat. This guy or a girl is your gateway 
to getting in that company, right? They can tell you about it. They can give you an in, right? Or maybe it's just an in or maybe they like you. And they basically sell you to the client. Let's talk about personal branding. Now, I've done videos in the past, like four years ago, about personal branding. Gary Vaynerchuk, he's written a book about Crush It. He's got tons of videos on his wine library stuff talking about personal branding. Basically identifying that out of the A, Bs, and Cs, and Ds, the Ds, Cs, and Ds have been outsourced. They're gone, right? So now you're competing with A players, A and B players. So how do you stand out from people who are awesome, right? You identify something that you're awesome at. You have a passion for whatever that is, and that's personal branding. There's a long, long list that I've created on my blog. You can see that as well, or you can watch the old videos. If people know that you are good at some particular thing, you're good at Android, you're good at Java, you're good at doing 3D library you know, things, you're good at sharding, you're good at whatever, or you just have a blog about it, people are going to start recognizing you that your brand is, oh yeah, he's the charting guy, right? That kind of thing. If you have a personal brand, getting in with a company is significantly easy. You won't have to have the interview. They go, yeah, that's the, that's the guy we want. We have a lot of visualizations. We need him. Or she is just fantastic at doing hardware integration. We want her, right? That's what you want to have happen before you even get in the interview because at that point, they're calling you for an offer. They're not calling you for an interview. They're calling you for an offer, right? And lastly is open source. This is a pretty easy slam dunk for a lot of people. I'm on social. I don't like meeting people. I have bad breath. I, whatever. Go to GitHub, Bitbucket, create an account, contribute something, advertise it, market it, talk about it on your blog, send it to email lists, You know, garner feedback from real users, aka developers, and say, look, I've contributed to open source projects. I, I fixed a patch in jQuery. Right? These are the kind of things. People say, wow, he's contributed to open source. He must be able to code. Or she, you know, helped manage that whole process as well as contribute patches to it. I mean, that's the kind of person we want on our team, right? They have an ability to give back. They recognize the value of open source. They already know how to work with a, a, a co-located team. Perfect skill set, right? So those three things, networking, personal branding, and open source, ensure that you get the job without the interview. Or if you go for the interview, it's stupid. To give an example, one interview I had, I, you know, was a little bit of both of networking and personal branding. The guy that I'd worked with knew me for my blog, and we had a good time working together for about a year at a telecom. So he invites me over to his company, and we talked about, I think, Battlefield uh, the entire 30 minutes of the interview. So at the interview, I was like, oh, yeah, you're here for a job interview, so I'll send you off a letter afterwards. I mean, that was it because they, they already knew I had the job. They just wanted to make sure I was crazy, right? They want to meet me, make sure I have reasonable hygiene, I can communicate effectively, I'm not you know, nuts. And that was it, right? That's how it's supposed to go down. <laughs> That's what you want. You don't want to be grilled by people who don't know you, and they have a predisposition to let you fail, right? Very bad. So let's talk about gaming behavior interviews. So I'm not going to go over interviews and all the other basic stuff. You can find that in the resources I, I gave you. But behavior interviews for programmers are very interesting because most programmers that are interviewed, they're more interested in your tech skills. Can you code? If you can code, you're valuable. Behavior interviews are not like that. Behavior interviews are a little bit more about your behavior and how will you, you know, your skill set work and what we want you to do. The, the theory is, is that past behavior and your responses to it will dictate how you will behave in the future, right? That's what the science says. So if they ask you questions, like instead of, you know, what is your weakness, they're not going to ask that. What they're going to ask is things like, give me a time where you had a, a problem in a project. How did you handle that? They give you a situation and you have to explain it. So behavior interviews are ridiculous. They are easy to hack. To give an example, I had a company like Accenture in my hometown, and they have the exact same interview process. I went through it. I aced the tech interview. I aced the intro interview with HR. For, for the most part, I was still a little bit more on the contract side. You know, I, It's hard to get rid of the contractor, right? Consultant, business owner kind of persona. But the last two, you know, they had a, a grueling, grilling behavior interview process where you had four people come and interview and ask the behavior interview questions, right? Completely failed, bombed. You know, I, I was very honest. You know, how'd you handle it? Well, this is really bad. It was messed up. And here's how I fixed it, right? That's not what it wanted to hear. What they wanted to hear was everything's positive and honky-dory, right? That's how behaviors are. Behavior interviews are they want to hear that everything you did – ended up honky-dory and positive, and you were positive, and you handled it in a positive way, even if you were in a hellish situation. That's what they want to hear. So to give you the hack, you just, really simple, go to Google, type in behavior interview star, 
And Allison Doyle has 10 behavior interview questions, right? But she'll talk about STAR, the interview technique at the bottom here. You click that, and she tells you exactly how to deal with the situation, right? STAR, the situation that you were in, the task that you were basically dictated to do, the action that you took to satisfy that attack, and what was the end result. All right, and that's, that's what they're looking for. And it's a really simple process. The key to passing it is to be positive. Nothing's negative. So I'm going to show you my list here. Okay, this is the list that I wrote for the Accenture interview because I completely bombed the original. I thought I had it in, in the bag. I thought I was, you know, I was overconfident. You know what I mean? I've been doing this for 13 years. How could I possibly fail? It's impossible. I've, I've gotten just about any other job I've wanted. I've been inundated with opportunities. What could go wrong? Everything. <laughs> Everything could go wrong. So, number one, my wife's advice at the very top, Jesse, don't rant. That's what YouTube's for, right? So, again, describe the situation and the task very clearly. Number two, what action did I take? Did I tell somebody? Did I write some code? Did I work really hard? doesn't matter what it was, but it's got to be painted with positivity, right? It's positive. Number three, positive outcome. No matter what I did, <laughs> it's positive. So they want to hear that I was through all this strife and all these challenges, and I rose victorious, right? This is so easy to hack. So here's what I did. I wrote down off the top of my head clients that I thought I really enjoyed, right? And I started speaking out loud. Like, here's what I, here's the situation. It was a bad situation. Here's the task. I had to fix this code or I had to add this thing. Everyone was really negative, you know, but I came through via this result, right? And I listed out all the clients that I dealt with in certain situations and I marked them. I said, which ones are positive? There's positives about everything, but some were really hard to get a positive result out. So a lot of those situations were just not positive enough for me to go in an interview and just feel like, oh yeah, I had some bad things, we, we arose victorious, right? So I chose, you know, a lot of thought went into this. I really thought for a couple hours, like what would be positive things and how could I fit that in that star process, right? Situation, task, action, result. How could I do that? It's behavior interview notes, very global stuff. Somebody who isn't very cooperative, I'm, I'm political, right? So I, I can write code, but I can also deal with people who don't want to work or don't want to cooperate or managers who are, you know, holding some particular data that I need to understand. How did I add value to the client, right? What, what are things that I did for my particular client that I added value? Even Now, see, again, this seems like obvious stuff, but it's not. You need to make sure that this starts off negative and ends positive, right? So you had, and not necessarily negative, more of like, challenging right you see you don't you just change the words they mean the same thing but when people hear you they go wow that sounds really hard like almost negative are you okay and he's like no no way here's the best part like i did this and i did this and that's right the end result was i'm awesome the client was awesome everyone was happy it was a magical feeling and lastly short keep it short jesse warden me notorious for going on and on and on with the details you got to keep it short so to give an example, I was brought in to fix a website that didn't work. My task was to, within three days, verify what was the problem. I you know, informed the client that typically my process is two weeks to get comfortable with the code, understand the build process, interview, interview the developers, and feel good that I actually have an understanding clearly of what the problem is. And so from that point, I can describe it effectively and give possible solutions. They said, no, you got three days. Oh my God. What did you do? Well, it wasn't even building. There, there, it wasn't even running. There was all kinds of challenges. I had a, a plan of attack. I kept them you know, informed transparently of what I was doing every hour on the hour. They didn't ask for this, and they, but they didn't say they were annoyed by it either. And I let them know the task that I was doing, what the end result was, and if, it, if I didn't find it, what I was going to do next. At the end of those three days, I found the two causes of the bugs. One was a memory leak and one was a build problem dealing with the current version of the software we were working with. We had to upgrade. The upgrade fixed it. The memory leak was also fixed. Everything worked. Everyone was happy and I gained a significant amount of credibility with my client. Now let's be clear here. The original situation was a lot more negative. There was a lot of bad things going on, bad drama. The client was freaking out. The project was, you know, probably going to be canceled if I didn't fix it within a, like the three days. I mean, it was bad. It was a really big, 
you know, tons of money they'd never done before, and this was kind of the linchpin of me solving it. It was really rough. It was really frustrating. It was hard work. It was a lot of, you know, blind in the dark, leaps of faith, those kind of things. I can't tell the behavior interview about that. It's got to be positive. It's got to have a positive spin. Everything about it's got to be, here's some negative things. They didn't affect me. I looked at those negative things as opportunities. I looked at that negative situation as my ability to help the client with my expertise. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. The client was really happy. It was a great end result. Yay, fairies and, and health potions. Like, you know what I mean? It's a positive spin. Take everything that you've ever had negative happen to you and just take a positive spin on it. How have I grown from that? I'm alive today. What from that experience, you know, can I tell somebody and they'll have a completely different perception about it. They'll see that negative experience in a completely different light than I experienced it, right? You want them to see that and see your growth and see your personal, you know, they want to see your character come from that experience, right? So again, positive spin. You take that negative situation and you paint it with positivity. Let's talk about fizz buzz, okay? So there's this trend that's been going on for the past couple years and I dealt with it last year multiple times. It's very obnoxious. People want you to code in front of them. They want to recognize that you can code. They're not interested in you. They're not interested in what you did. They don't even care about your open source contributions, your little projects you put on the blogs that you worked really, really hard on with a lot of other people and collaborated to create awesome stuff. They don't care. All they want to know is if they can open Notepad or text edit and you can write some very simple code. If you can't even write four lines of code, we're not interested. If you can't do that in front of us right here, right now, that must mean that you are incapable of delivering software. Now you can understand that I'm a little irritated, and I am, because it's it's created by Coding Horror was the one that popularized it. He wasn't the one that started it, but he was one of the ones that kind of fueled it along. And some people get really nervous. All that, you know, pressure of people who want you to fail and give you something that's not your normal IDE. They put you in an uncomfortable situation which you normally wouldn't code in, right? You wouldn't have your Red Bull machine or your coffee with your, you know, your laptop sitting at your comfortable desk or, you know, you got a positive team next to you and you got some design comps. You're, you're really excited to build something. That's not how it is at all. It's a very high-pressure situation. If you don't want to effectively code this for loop with an efficient algorithm within 10 minutes, you're not getting a job. And that's it. No pressure there, bro. If you're not going to do the networking, you're not going to do the personal branding, you're not going to do the open source, right? You choose not to do those, and they're not going to do a behavior interview. They're more interested in fizz buzz, and that's their metric to determine whether you're qualified or not. Then at that point, you better hope you practiced. You better hope that you opened Notepad, you went and found a code kata, and you got all your friends say, guys, I haven't even done this code kata. Can you look at me and, and scare me? Right, be intimidating. Well, I attempt to accomplish this in 10 minutes. Ready, go. If you've done that a few times, you will ace FizzBuzz, right? So it doesn't matter, you know, if the client likes you or everything else. I've seen FizzBuzz, you know, I, I know I failed some interviews in part because of FizzBuzz. You know, I mean, you can look on GitHub, you can see the videos I've produced. I can code. I've got a long track record of it. I got a lot of clients who are very happy with what I've produced. I got some people who are appreciative of some of the code I produced. Doesn't matter. Clients don't care. Can't do it in front of them. You must not be able to code. That is what they're left with. That's the impression that they have. Never get a second chance to make a first impression. So practice fizz buzz if you're not going to do the first two. If you're just going to play the game, if you're not going to do fizz buzz, the only other chance you have is to memorize the API. And the key is to make sure that you know the API better than they do. Your other hope is if they screw up and you correct them in the interview. If somebody corrects you on an API in an interview, it usually goes bad. It's not that you're dumb. You know, you might know the API, but you misspelled something. That's okay, right? But a lot of people feel like if they have to correct you, you must not know it, right? It's just I've seen it time and time again. So, for example, if you put Backbone or Angular in your resume, you better know the basics of what's in the docs, right? I don't care if you don't know the underpinnings, but if you don't know the basics – most people are going to get very, very nervous. So the best thing you can do is memorize the API the night before, just like an American high school test. Memorize the paper, you know, cram for the exam. You memorize it, you go in there, and you're going to ace it. So let me give you two stories about how all this 
networking and personal branding and gaming behaviors and fizzbuzz works, okay? So I've already told you about how I, I got the Accenture interview. The first behavior interview went horrible. I learned my lesson. You know, you make a mistake. You make sure you don't make that mistake again. You learn from your mistakes and grow, right? And I grew from that mistake. I said, I need to learn how to do behavior interviews. I thought I was the man. I thought I had a great track record. I thought that would play a show. Not the case at all. I need to play their game. I chose not to play the game. I thought I was playing the game, but I didn't know the rules, and I lost. So the, what I did is I went online. I read Allison's article. I practiced STAR. I did everything she recommended from having a positive attitude, getting some situations ready to go, do some role-playing with myself, make sure you know that I understand how I'm going to explain the STAR process, went in there, make sure I'm always positive, right? feel good about it. When I was in there, that confidence shone through, knocked it out of the park. Same interview. 55% chance that I'm going to be successful in those behavior interviews. Flip a coin. Flip a coin, right? So let's talk about IBM. IBM was not like that. They didn't know me. They didn't know about FizzBuzz at the time. This is back, I don't know, early 2000s. You know, I had just come off of a really bad, it was my first job. Spiraled really bad after the dot-com, so I left. I mean, the place was deteriorating. I, I made sure I left when I was in a good spot before things went really bad. I didn't have a choice to leave, right? It's easier to get a job when you already have a job, okay? So if you try to get one without one, it's significantly different. Well, IBM had our I didn't know this. I was a recruiter at the time. And I've already told you about recruiters. <laughs> IBM had already had interviewed four people before me. And like a lot of people in our industry through recruiters, they weren't vetted. The recruiters say, oh, you have keywords on your resume? You must be qualified. And if you're not, oh, I've just got to vet you better. I'm sorry, Mr. Klein. I'll work harder, right? They're not held accountable for it. So the, the companies continue to use these recruiters, don't really care. So I was number five. And so when they asked me, how are you at programming this particular language? Um, uh, rate yourself from one being bad to five being awesome. Five. I'm I'm awesome. I love it. I do it. I breathe it every day. I've written blog posts. I've written components. People love my code. You know, it's awesome. I, I just, I love life right now, actually. So yeah, five. They sighed. They looked very disheartened. Their body language showed that something I said was not what I thought the reaction I was going to get. So they asked again. They said, so in using the tooling, Rate yourself from one to five. Are you good at the tooling? Can you navigate around? Or are you still learning? I'm like, five. I've been doing this for like five years. I love it. It's off the chain. It's easy for cheesy. Again, the HR lady got up from the desk, walked away, and you know, excused herself from the interview. And the other guy basically started telling me about the company. Stopped asking me questions and leaned back. His body language is very, you know, like I give up. And I knew, spotty sense was tingling. I knew something was wrong. And I started getting angry. I started getting angry because I knew that there was no way that if I left this interview when he started wrapping it up, that they had any idea that I was qualified. They had no idea that I could code. They had no idea that what level I could code because I knew in the industry that most people didn't do that level that I was at the time doing that particular technology. It was Flash. Most people back then didn't do MVC, didn't do components, didn't do class order, didn't do init clip, didn't do oop. And basically JavaScript, because it was JavaScript at the time, really, is what it was. It just had a little bit of, you know, different language additions. Now, keep in mind, too, the recruiter actually told me that the four candidates before me had come in and completely bombed. They had said that they were awesome and completely just missed the box. They said they were awesome, but they actually weren't. They, they didn't know basic programming. So I knew kind of going in that this was my chance to prove them you know, that I really was qualified. I didn't know that it was actually working against me by being so confident and happy that I was, they thought I was trying to tell them what they wanted to hear. So I knew that something was wrong and I got angry and I said, sir, I'm sorry. My wife had demanded that I put my code on this little CD business card and I'd be, you know, hum I humbly request you let me show it because I don't feel like you've seen anything I've done. I worked really hard on this. I'm very proud of it. And I feel like if you saw this, you would recognize that I'm actually capable of delivering what you're asking. I, I don't know the projects, but I feel like some of the things you described. Will you please allow me to have that opportunity? And he's like completely surprised, like, well, absolutely. You have code? What's that? Oh, I don't know. I'm a programmer. I write code. So we walked to the other room. I showed him the code classes. He was completely like, uh, the entire time. And I got the job, right? Strictly from that. So props to my wife. But, you know, props to basically coming prepared, right? Coming with sample code. So maybe if they had FizzBud at the time and I couldn't produce, I, I would have. Okay, I was that, you know, amped up. But 
If they didn't, look, I wrote this last night. This wasn't from Google. This is something I did, and I can intelligently talk about this code that I wrote because I'm comfortable with it. It's mine. I built it, right? It's not some, you know, for loop trying to iterate through some stupid number pound a drone. You know, things I would never do in the real world. Like, this is stuff I would really do in the real world. It's a media player. It's a slideshow, right? Those kind of things. That's one thing where coming with your own code really helped me out. Lastly, what, what precluded... Uh, getting my job with Accenture this year was the last year I'd, I'd been a consultant independent business owner for about eight years. So I'd done some staff aug, I'd worked with some firms, and I eventually just formed my own with some partners. And, you know, some of it was independent, but some of it was th with them. So I basically was a business owner, right? After, I'm, I'm really tired of the sales. I'm really tired of dealing with invoices. I needed a break. I needed a break. I wanted to continue to do coding, but I needed somebody else to handle that. You know, I started looking around just around my area. I assumed that I would live in Virginia and work elsewhere. And so I said, all right, I'll look around what's in Virginia. I had never, I didn't have any intention to ever work here, but let's have an open mind and see what they have. Maybe there's some DC too that would let me telecommute. You know, why not? Interview after interview after interview. They didn't know me. They had no idea what I could produce. They already had a string of candidates who couldn't produce. So they were already like expecting me to fail before I even walked in the door. They didn't care who I was. They didn't care what I did. They didn't like the fact that I had ran my own business and I, you know, had that mentality of trying to produce value for the client. I was interested in the numbers that went into the, you know, things that make non-business owners nervous, right? They, they, they look at you as a consultant and it makes them nervous. You know, God forbid you'd be able to code. Just one after the other. Networking. I leveraged my network. I got really frustrated. I said, do you have anybody who could get a job? Uh, a particular tech giant that makes something that's not a Mac said, hey, let's talk. So I flew down, you know, I did a series of interviews with, interviews with them and, you know, they knew me. They had some guy in the company that had already sold me and they said, well, if you know this guy, you must be awesome. The interviews actually read my blog. They actually took the time to actually read it and said, well, look, if you're coming to this kind of company and you have someone of this caliber vouching for you, then it's worth our time to invest in you to get to know you and really understand who you are, ask effective questions, do that, right? This is all from just me sending an email. Hey, bro, you got any jobs at that company you're at? He's like, yeah, man, I didn't know you were looking for jobs. That's great. Yeah, I posted on Twitter twice, but uh, you know, I, you're on Twitter 24-7, but you never saw it. Good thing I sent the email, right? Go networking. So fail at social media. So that one worked out well. I got an interview, and then I found out they were going to take my uh, iPhone and Mac away, and that, you know, that, that made my decision very clear. So the second one, personal branding. I talk a lot about a particular language that's not JavaScript. And I was like, you know, I really want to I want to do this. This is fun. I enjoy it. Lo and behold, the tech giant who makes that tech saw me on Google+, Plus, sent me an email and said, hey, bro, you want to come work for us? And I'm like, absolutely. And they're like, what are you, you want to move to California? I'm like, no way. And they're like, yeah, that's a requirement. So that went out. But two opportunities, one from networking, one for personal branding, both of which I had the job. Like the, the, the tech giant interviews, you know, they were really pretty easy to go through because they were somewhat behavior interview, which I already practiced for. But they were also like really just more interested in, you know, my ability to desire to learn and things like that, which very easy to do. Good examples where I know the job for networking. The last one, Accenture. I knew a guy who'd offered me actually to come on to Accenture three years prior. So I, I, I kept in contact with him, right? You know, I just... Every so often I ask him, he'd always been a mentor for me because he's more of a project manager and like, you know, not only sales, but he knew how to run, you know, and manage projects. And I always found that interesting from software because co part of my job as a consultant is seeing nothing but chaos, right? And trying to, you know, make sure that the software works amidst that chaos, right? And I always felt, you know, if I could get above the chaos, further into the wind of the storm, maybe I can make a difference downstream. So I'd ask him advice. So by nurturing that relationship over time, a lot of it was one way of me asking questions, but I'd try to send him resources. He said, yeah, the job's still completely open. We'd love to have you. And so that was my end. That was my way to not be some blind person. They had someone like him vouch for me, send my resume to multiple departments. And at that point, I just had to pass the behavior. You know, networking was two of those. Personal branding was one of them. Now, that this is not mathematically, you know, poignant. The point is, is that these kind of things were significantly easier because, you know, I got, I got to go interview, interview, and talk about stuff, talk about the industry. I didn't have to play the game. I still had to do the behavior interview. And for the other tech giant, I still had to have some of the interviews. But all this thing of we don't care about you, you know, if you can't write code and 
no patent 10 minutes, you're gone. All that stuff goes away. You know what I mean? All that stuff in my open source that I've worked really hard on, I've, I've really been passionate about, and no one even thinks that it has any metric or viability reflection of me at all. They say that doesn't matter. If you don't know how to add an event listener backbone, you must be completely incapable of producing any code. So you've memorized the whole thing and you never use Google? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Those are the things that I think you should do. To summarize, you play the game, you get played by it, or you make your own rules. If you're going to play the game, you're going to do all those things I talked about. You're going to you know, wear, the, wear the suit, look really professional. You're going to practice star for behavior interviews. You're going to practice code katas with fizzbuzz to make sure you can code in front of other people in negative, high-pressure situations. You're going to memorize the API of whatever they're going to ask them to make sure that you can correct the interviewer and sound like, oh, I'm so smart, in an attackful, present way, right? Um, and, and feel like you're educating them and bringing you know, something to the table. And finally, having sample code that you've produced, not something you grabbed off Google that was like an Angular to-do MVC. No, something that you produced, you're proud about, and can comfortably talk about to sound like you actually understand what they're hiring for. Positive attitude. That's playing the game. Making your own rules is networking. I know people at that company, so there's no need for me to the interview. Just they'll vouch for me. Done. End of story. Personal branding. You're known as the charting guy. They need a visualization person. Your work is on Google. Everyone linked to it in the blog or that awesome Twitter post. Done. Got, got the job. No need for an interview other than to make sure you're not crazy, right? Standard stuff. We're open source. I contributed to jQuery. I am the man. Cool. Done. Right? That has a lot of weight. People see that and they go, oh, you must be awesome. Okay? That kind of stuff. Or even just open source that shows that you do code. That's what you do in your spare time. And if you do it in your spare time, you must love it. Thus, you must be better than average, thus you're somebody we want, right? There's a lot of stereotypes about open source that you can leverage to your advantage. Okay. Gaming behavior interviews, just Google Star. Allison Doyle has a lot of wonderful things that can give you good advice on it. For those of you who don't have a lot of coding experience, the best thing you can do is create sample projects. How are you supposed to get a job right out of college as a programmer or, you know, as a designer building websites or applications when you don't have any clients? You know, you're, they didn't teach you contracting. They didn't teach you sales. They didn't teach you how to do that. So you're expected to go right into an intern job. You know how many intern jobs are available, you know, that actually are with good companies? You know, they're hard to get into. So the best thing you can do is blog, write a project, you know, upload it to GitHub, one of those three things, right? The best thing, is, bare minimum, is write some code, you know, not every night, but whenever you have time, as, as soon as possible. If, I did it every night, so I'm, you know, I'm sure you can find time too. And put it up there, talk about it, and have these things working so somebody online can see them, whether locally on your laptop or on a website somewhere. So when you go in an interview, like, look, I don't have a lot of experience, but this is what I've done in my spare time. The people that you want to work with recognize that you can learn. They recognize that you want to learn. You're not going to go, oh, the Ajax get request doesn't work. What do I do? I found something on Stack Overflow. It doesn't make any sense. Help. No. You figure it out. You go in there and debug. You open Chrome Debugger. You don't know how to debug. You learn to debug on the spot. You don't know anything about less. You Google less on Google and you try some things out. Like that kind of attitude, the ability to learn, the desire to learn, the desire to figure out, you know, you don't have to be micromanaged by somebody. Those kind of qualities will shine through when you have sample code. It shows that you do it, shows that you want to learn, shows that you're knowing it, shows that you're learning, shows that you're valuable, that you can produce code. You can write code that works. That is a very precious resource in our industry, right? People who can write code that works. Definitely something to do. Blog about it, talk about it. Those sample projects will be your experience. That will be your past clients, right? Or example clients. You sh you have that kind of work. That is your portfolio. That is the work that you show that mean you know showcases what you can do. I understand it's hard work. It's going to take you a long time. You got to look at it positively. Do you like programming or not? If you have the passion for it and love it, pick something. I don't know how to, you know, build. Like I, I had a problem. I wanted to track my workouts. Cool. So I built something in Angular in a website to figure it out. I wanted to learn Angular. I wanted to solve a rule of problem. Here's what I produced. I've never done pathfinding in games before. So I said, hey, let's go learn A star. So I hear I implemented an A star algorithm in my language of choice. Those are the kind of things, you know, variety. Hopefully applicable to the job, you know, like applications for an application job, gaming for a gaming job, right? You're building sample projects that will target those particular clients. So good luck. Keep your heads up. Again, those are the things I suggest. 
if, if, if you ignore anything from this video, the one thing I want you to take away is that you don't want to go to the interview. Plan A, get the job before you even arrive, if you can, if you can get away with it. If you can't, then plan B, go to the interview for practice. As long as you're not in a bad you know, mindset, as long as you're feeling positive, go for the practice. Right? You're not going to waste the client's time because maybe you are a fit. Maybe you're meeting the company. Maybe you really want to work there. At first, it seemed kind of negative, but you met the team. You're like, man, I would really like to work with this team. They sound pretty cool. right? So go to the interview. Interviews in a real-world scenario, you don't get a lot of practice. So take the opportunity. So plan A and plan B. Good luck, people. Again, if you've got any other questions, my name is Jesse Warden. You can hit me up on Google+, Facebook, Twitter, email. I'll do my best to answer your questions. I've been traveling a lot. I apologize because I'm in Texas. Yeah, good luck, man. It's it's going to be hard, so you, especially nowadays. There's a lot of companies who still have a broken interview process. You're just going to have to power through. You may have to do a lot of interviews. Just remember there's a lot of people that you know were rejected many, many times, and the reason they were finally accepted is because they didn't give up. So you don't give up either. Never give up.